Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. No matter how you look at it, animal agriculture helps Nebraska's economy. The livestock industry provides increased tax revenues for schools and community services. Livestock enterprises also create jobs while contributing to existing businesses such as local banks and grocery stores. A thriving livestock industry helps maintain our current way of life, but also provides opportunities for the next generation of farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff helps to raise awareness of the importance of animal agriculture to Nebraska. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Rain Olson updates us on wheat harvest results across the country and a recent dive in the soybean market. Kirsten Wise explains whether or not foliar fungicide applications in soybeans can boost yield. Matt Spangler recaps the recent Beef Cattle DNA Technology Conference. Bob Wright gives recommendations for dealing with spider mites. And Curtis Harms takes us inside UNL's Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic. For the first time since May 21st, all of Nebraska is again in drought. 35% of the state is in the worst two categories. Dry conditions are creeping farther east as nearly two-thirds of Iowa is now listed in drought. Even so, crop conditions are drastically better than they were a year ago. At this time in 2012, U.S. corn was 37 percentage points lower in good to excellent categories, while soybeans were 33 points worse. Frank Olson from North Dakota State is our marketing analyst this week. As U.S. wheat harvest continues to progress, we asked Frayne about yield results as well as international issues producers may want to keep an eye on. But first, we go where the confusion is. Old crop soybeans had a rough week, to put it lightly. They found the limit on Wednesday. Thursday, at least at the time of this taping, was more leaking. As we started with Frayne Thursday morning, we simply asked what was happening. Well, you know, most of that decrease has come in old crop soybeans. And for, for quite some time, we've been very concerned about the pace at which we've been using old crop soybeans. The export pace has been very strong. Domestic crush has been very strong. And so old crop soybeans have had quite a premium to new crop soybeans, or that spread, that differential, has been relatively wide. And again, the, the idea is high prices need to ration use. Well, there's a recognition now of two things. First, that differential, that spread, is becoming relatively wide, uh, wider than normal. And then there's, uh, uh, the expectation for a pretty good crop coming in on the U.S. soybeans. So again, some of the weather forecasts, um, extended forecasts, and crop development has is, is been pretty good right now. Uh, the fact that we're not going to have uh, very uh, high heat and humidity and little rainfall during the, the key pollination and flowering stages now is giving us better hope that we're going to have a stronger um, uh, old crop uh, production and as a result we're looking at those and saying you know it doesn't look like we have to have that premium in the market anymore and once that started shifting the, a lot of the speculative community and the investment community which had been working on those spreads suddenly realized we've overdone this a bit and we're going to have to bring that back into line. Wednesday was an especially rough day and you might have thought that the bleeding was done then but as we stand Thursday morning it's down again and it's down again hard what would be the, what would be the advice if you decided to hold on through this thing? Well, first, I know you got to get over the fact of, of kicking yourself, saying I sh woulda, shoulda, coulda. Um, and so just recognize that we're in a little bit of a new environment. And, and to be very blunt, in my perspective, the soybean crop is not made yet. We still have some uh, development and, and quite a bit before harvest. So there's still some production problems that could occur. And the soybean stocks are tight enough that, as well as corn, that we're going to have a major response uh, from price standpoint if there is a production problem. Now, at this stage, you're still gambling. Um, depending upon bin space and your available cash flow, uh, you know, there's kind of two strategies. You take your lumps, you cut and run, and say this is the way it is. Or if you're willing to gamble and have the capacity to do that, you know, we, do, we do have about a month worth of, of marketing year left in the old crop. 
um, there's still some sparks that occur, can occur. All right, let's move into wheat. Uh, harvest continues to roll. What are you seeing or what are you hearing for yield results across the country? Well, for the winter wheat crop, it's extremely variable. We always have some variation or some range of yields and quality, uh, but this year it's really been an extreme range in, in both production and yields, as well as the quality attributes. So in general, if we kind of generalize or pool this together, in general, I think most farmers were a bit pleased. Uh, they, they had better yields than they'd expected, but there are some quality issues starting to show up. And, and I also recognize now from a quality standpoint, it's really the cash market that has to deal with those issues. We're not going to see major changes in the futures market because of quality. That's primarily concerned about the quantity or the bushel issue. So just be watching your local cash market on the discounts and premiums that are out there. Um, there might be some opportunities if you have some higher quality wheat. That's domestically. What about internationally for those countries that are kind of on the same schedule here of production? Yeah, there's a couple of things we're looking forward to. I mean, there's things in the market we need to be keeping an eye on. Uh, on the production side, it looks as though the, the expectations out of uh, Russia for their wheat production is slowly being nibbled away. Um, the most recent expectations are, are actually much lower than what USDA WASD forecasts are. So we'll wait to see what USDA does with, uh, with the Russian ex production numbers. Um, on the demand side, there's a few things that are also developing, again, positive for world wheat prices. One of them is that, that Egypt has now uh, been able to, to get a financing package put together. Uh, the last couple of years, they've drawn down their domestic stocks. It looks as though they are going to be coming into the market now and trying to rebuild those stocks as well as add some political stability uh, because of their wheat subsidy program they have domestically. The other thing we're watching very closely is what's happening in China. China is a major wheat producer, but also a major wheat consumer. And they've also had some production problems with some disease issues, as well as some extremely wet weather. And as a result, um, their milling quality wheat supplies are a bit short this year. They've already come in and bought some U.S. wheat, uh, primarily soft red winter wheat. The expectation as we move forward is they get into their harvest time period now, and they're finding out how many bushels and, and the quality the expectation is they'll come back into the world market and buy some more uh, milling quality wheat, which again, uh, the U.S. has ample supplies right now. We talk so much about wheat following corn or following corn and soybeans. Does that principle still stay or do they now split and operate independently? Um, I'm, I'm expecting that the wheat market and the, and the corn market are going to start separating. Up until this point, um, old crop corn supplies have been so tight that the milling wheat market has had to have a substantial premium over corn just to stay competitive and prevent wheat milling wheat from going into feed channels. And now we're starting to see as corn prices have come down, uh, world supply demand conditions tighten up on the world wheat market. I do expect that the wheat market will start to separate itself a bit more from corn. There's always going to be a linkage there, but I think we're going to start to see wheat more responsive to the supply demand conditions of wheat. Next week, Roy Smith will join us to analyze corn and soybean markets. With continued drought, Nebraska's crop producers are leaning, if not depending, on irrigation to grow their acres in 2013. There is already a measurable distance between the state's irrigated and dry land corn, as 82% of Nebraska's irrigated corn is rated good or excellent, while only 45% of its dry land is rated in those best two categories. Nebraska Farm Bureau quantified the importance of being able to water crops even more this week when their sponsored study revealed the ability to irrigate Nebraska crops added $11 billion to Nebraska's economy in 2012. The report showed Nebraska would have had at least 31,000 fewer jobs without irrigation, with more than one-third of those coming outside of crop production. As for the value of the water itself, Nebraska Farm Bureau's study said every inch of water put on an acre of cropland generates approximately $100 of economic benefit to the state. Now our continuing coverage from the 2013 World Soybean Research Conference in South Africa. Kirsten Wise is a plant pathologist at Purdue University. With colleagues from universities across Midwestern soybean producing states, Kirsten studied the decision to apply foliar fungicide applications in soybeans. While results showed a yield boost in response, the choice to apply isn't necessarily recommended for every situation. 
You know, in soybean production, we didn't often use fungicides, you know, a decade ago. But, you know, we did have soybean rust. It was confirmed in 2005, and growers have now been really educated about diseases and the impact that they can have on soybean production. Now, that's kind of coupled with we do have some new products that are labeled, and some of these products are promoted to have um, benefits, like physiological effects on the plant that can increase yield even in the absence of disease. So with the market costs, what they are right now, growers are very interested in increasing yields, and fungicides can be a part of that program. Right, one of the things you said today was the common question you get is, should I spray? Yes. What all weighs into that decision? Well, a lot of factors, mostly economic, um, and we also like to think about, you know, is there a disease or an insect or a pest threat that needs to be taken care of? Because these are pesticides that, you know, are used to manage those, those factors. And so, you know, a grower has to think about a lot of things. Is it right for his production system? And, and mostly, what are the economics of it? And like you said, and we've talked about it before with Lauren Geisler, who is also on the team that you worked with, uh, there is a, a thought that maybe you can get a boost on yield from using fungicide or the combination of fungicide and insecticide. So you did some research on that in a multi-state region. Describe the uh, layout of that research. Sure. Well, what we did was we, we have, we're all conducting these trials anyway across the state. So we wanted to combine all of the results of these trials to see if there's trends that we can use to, to really predict where a fungicide or a fungicide and insecticide might pay. And what we did, compiled all of the analysis, um, looked at the economic returns, and what we find is that, you know, in most areas we can see, you know, between one and two bushel response from a fungicide application and then in, in most areas we also see maybe a little bit more of an increase with a fungicide plus an insecticide. And you sprayed no matter if there was a trace of disease, correct? That's right. We were actually doing just a standard R3 application of a fungicide or a fungicide plus insecticide. So like you said, you saw some boost. Um, that coupled with the economic factors that play in in terms of whether or not you get the return, does it prove to be worth it? Well, so it does depend on the application cost and the price of soybean. And we did use like, the five-year average for soybean prices and an, an average market cost. And what we found was it, it's profitable with both the fungicide and the fungicide plus insecticide about a little less than 50% of the time. Which means what for the farmer? Well, it means that the, the farmer really needs to think about, is this a good fit for my production system based on the economics? And so we, we really can't you know, pick out a trend that you know, we should be applying it in all situations but you know in situations where maybe it's a more susceptible variety for disease um, looking for very high economic gains you know, maximizing production so in those situations a fungicide or a fungicide plus insecticide may be a benefit and finally what would be the problem with a farmer saying you know what I'm just gonna spray even if I might only hit 50% of the time I'm just gonna spray no matter what well we realize it's, it's really an economic issue right now but you know as plant pathologists we are concerned about the buildup of fungicide resistance in our fungal populations and so what we do worry about is, you know, well, maybe there would be some point where we need to control a disease, but these fungicides are no longer effective against that disease. So we just want to educate farmers about that, make sure that they know that, you know, right now we're doing it to, to maximize yields, but there may come a time where we can no longer do this. To see more of our reporting from the 2013 World Soybean Research Conference in South Africa, including discussions on crop rotation and soybean systematode, you can visit our website at marketjournal.unl.edu slash South Africa. UNL's Nebraska Business Forecast Council is anticipating farm incomes in the state will decline in the next two years from 2011's record high levels. The results point to gradual dissipation of drought that could reduce corn prices, as well as farm incomes affected by removal of subsidies from a new farm bill. The forecast shows a 3.7 percent drop in farm incomes for 2013 to $5.2 billion. It then sees a further 3.8 percent drop in 2014, which would put farm income at $5 billion in both 2014 and 2015. The fifth annual DNA Technology and Beef Cattle Conference was recently held at the USDA Meat Animal Research Center in Clay Center. Earlier this week, we talked with Matt Spangler about what presenters discussed and the importance of the conference. You know, this, this technology, DNA information, or really genomics, has been uh, evolving over the years and, and at a pretty rapid pace. And so we thought it important to have an annual meeting uh, like this to keep the industry uh, as well as extension personnel updated uh, in terms of, of how this information is actually being utilized. So what are some of the updates to uh, the Breeding Association and some genome work that you've been working on? Yeah, you know, really uh, uh, genomics have been incorporated into our expected progeny differences or EPDs uh, by the American Angus Association since 2009. But, but since then, several other breed associations have begun 
augmenting their EPDs with, with genomic information. And so I think that's really exciting to see that information being adopted and utilized by the industry, uh, whereby they can actually increase the accuracy of EPDs on, on young animals. And so we provide an update relative to which breeds are doing that, how it's working, and where we see that technology going in the future. One of the ways I, I think that technology can really benefit the beef industry is providing some insight into the genetic potential of animals for what we might consider novel traits, things like uh, feed intake and feed efficiency or disease susceptibility. And those are really the highlights of two USDA funded projects right now. I'm involved in the one centered on genomic predictors for feed efficiency, and we provided some updates relative to that uh, five-year, $5 million effort that's currently going on. And, and so provided the industry with some ideas relative to, to the early research results. The other one I mentioned, uh, bovine respiratory disease, is another very large USDA-funded project aimed at developing genomic predictors for disease susceptibility in beef cattle. So we plan to, on an annual basis, provide research updates relative to those two projects. How far along are they? How could they help producers in the end? Uh, the feed efficiency project is actually in its fourth year right now. And so we already see uh, beef breed associations beginning to adopt some of the early uh, genomic results coming out of that project. The BRD grant is, is a little bit younger in terms of its maturity right now, um, and it's focused not only on beef cattle, but also on dairy cattle. And so I think there's some early results relative to the dairy component uh, that are available right now to the industry. Specifically in Clay Center, is there some uh, research being done at the Meat Animal Research Center that uh, focuses here? Yeah, huge effort in terms of genomics at U.S. Mark. Uh, one of those areas is on uh, using sequence information, so actually doing whole genome sequencing on animals and trying to determine the best way to utilize that information. So tremendous effort going on uh, at the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center with the goal in mind of developing genomic tools that can be used by the beef industry. Presentations from the recent DNA Technology Conference can be found online at beefefficiency.org. We'll also link to that on the Market Journal homepage. We told you last week how soybean aphids were making their way to Nebraska soybean fields. This week, it's spider mites. UNL educators are reporting spider mites are starting to build up primarily in corn, but also in soybeans. UNL Extension entomologist Bob Reich talks about finding and treating these pests. Things to look for, typically they build up in, in water-stressed plants, so either uh, dry, dry pivot corners or areas with sandy soil or maybe a south or west facing side of the field is often where spider mites start building up. And the thing to look for is they feed on the undersides of the leaves. They have small, tiny needle-like mouth parts that stick into the, the leaf and suck out the, the uh, green tissue. And so you have yellow spots that you can see from above. And so look in the lower parts of plants and see if you can see yellowing or yellow spots. And then turn the leaves over and see if you can see spider mites. Uh, sometimes there may be webbing associated with the feeding if they're very abundant. The other thing is you know, need to be aware that we don't want to treat too early because most of the insecticides we'd use for spider mites also kill off the natural enemies that help control them. So we want to wait, wait until we have a threshold to treat, uh, but also be aware there's other insects around that may be building up on soybeans in particular, such as uh, soybean aphid or stink bugs to watch for as well. More detailed treating information for spider mites is available on the CropWatch website. We'll also link to that through our homepage. Daily average milk production at the Temi Dairy near Wayne shot up from 70 pounds per cow to 90 pounds in the past two years. The July Nebraska farmer explains the production boost occurred primarily from a new tunnel ventilated barn that Doug Temi built with his son John. Doug says the key attribute of the facility makes for more content cows. The barn also features an automatic flushing manure management system. You can read more about it in the July Nebraska Farmer. Diseases in crops are a significant factor in limiting yields in Nebraska. Treatment is often most effective when diseases are identified early and correctly. Organized in 1994, UNL's Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic helps farmers diagnose plant and insect problems. Market Journal's Curtis Harms has more. Just as medical doctors diagnose patients at clinics, experts at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic diagnose plant and insect problems. These diagnoses can help farmers manage crop health. On average, the clinic receives nearly 1,200 plant and insect samples a year. 
Kevin Corris is the coordinator for UNL's Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic. He says the clinic is open year-round, but the lab is busiest during the agricultural growing season. Being here in Nebraska, I think row crops are probably my most common plant. Um, I see a lot of corn and a lot of soybeans in here. Early on in the, in the spring, I'll see a bunch of wheat come in, um, some sorghum diseases, but mostly corn and soybeans. The Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic is broken up into five labs. The Disease Diagnostic Lab, the Insect Lab, a General Horticulture Lab, a Weed Science Lab, and a Nematology Lab. For a small fee, anyone, from farmers to gardeners, can submit a sample. UNL Extension plant pathologist Tamer Jackson Zims says the costs associated with properly diagnosing a crop disease can pay off when making management decisions. It's one of our most common diseases right now in Nebraska corn is Goss's wilt. And when people were first becoming familiar with it, many of them were spraying it with a fungicide and sometimes a second application, spending upwards of 25 to up to $50 per acre, and then learning later that it was a bacterial disease, Goss's wilt, that couldn't be controlled. And so we could have saved producers potentially thousands of dollars with a 40 or $50 diagnosis up front. While the lab may be able to answer questions on plant health, identification, or insect information, there are a few services that the Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic is unable to provide. The clinic does not provide mycotoxin testing. We can identify there, and our diagnostician can identify the organisms growing in, say, the corn ear or the grain, but we can't tell you whether or not the toxin are being produced, only speculate. We can also not diagnose herbicide contamination problems. Those advanced tests require being sent off to another lab for advanced testing. Samples can be delivered to the clinic in Lincoln personally or through the mail. In addition to the plant sample in question, it may also be a good idea to include a healthy plant for comparison. Samples should be fresh and include as much information as possible. The best sample is one that is just beginning to show symptoms or having several plants showing a continuum of different levels of disease severity from very minor to very advanced. Most of the time, if it's feasible, we want you to, to collect the entire plant. A dead plant is probably not a good example. Once, once you get your sample collected, it's, it's very important to put it in a, a sealable plastic bag first. A lot of people will put their samples in paper bags, um, which we don't recommend because uh, they'll dry out. Treat them like you would the produce you bring home from the grocery store so that they're in good condition and we see them as fresh as possible. We ask that you ship it early in the week between Monday and Wednesday so that it gets to the clinic before the weekend and it doesn't sit over the weekend in, in a UPS truck or a FedEx truck or something like that or the U.S. mail. For more detailed information on how to properly submit a sample or for more information on the Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic, visit pdc.unl.edu. You can also call area code 402-472-2559. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Curtis Harms. Thanks, Curtis. Once at the lab, most samples can be diagnosed within 24 hours, but there may be some samples that require advanced testing. We'll link to additional resources from the UNL Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic on our website. Now here's UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher with this week's weather forecast. Well, folks, here we are again for the weekly forecast. Last week we talked about the potential for some significant moisture across eastern Nebraska. The trough that did develop across the upper Midwest actually dug a little bit farther toward the southwest, and we've seen that precipitation band shift into central and western Nebraska, leaving much of eastern Nebraska fairly high and dry. The major activity for eastern Nebraska did fall in the midweek to late week time frame as we've seen a couple pieces of energy move across the southern part of the state and intersect a cold front moving through the Dakotas that did touch off some scattered thunderstorm activity, which did give us at least uh, the hope that if we can get continue to get moisture, that it will alleviate some of the pressures of stress on this developing corn crop. Now, as we go forward in time, we're looking at a similar scenario where we have this cold air that's moved in with this late thunderstorm activity that will hold this weekend. And then as it progresses toward the northeast, we'll start to put some of that monsoon moisture from the desert southwest back into the central high plains, and we'll return to the scattered thunderstorm activity across the western part of the state with several chances in the eastern part of the state as the activity moves into our region. So let's take a look at the upper air models and see how this should play out if the models are correct as we go through this next seven day period. And the first thing of course is the upper air trough that's bringing in this cooler temperatures. In fact, temperatures today and tomorrow are gonna to be very similar to what we would expect to see sometime during the middle to late part of September. We'll be looking at highs primarily in the 70s to low 80s across the state. 
and we do have the chance for isolated thunderstorm activity, but most of that should be across the western part of the state where this monsoonal moisture will ride up against the backside of this trough and generate those, those thunderstorms. In eastern Nebraska, very likely we would just see an isolated thunderstorm here and there, but no broad-based coverage. The same situation holds true for tomorrow, although we might see that moisture moving a little bit farther toward the east into the central part of the state, and especially during the overnight hours, there is indications as we move into Monday morning, Monday afternoon, that we'll get another piece of energy riding across the northern part of the state that should generate a pretty decent area of thunderstorm activity across northeastern Nebraska, with some of that expected to fall toward the southeastern Nebraska as it rides down the Mississippi or the Missouri River Valley. And if the models are correct, total quantitative precipitation for this three-day period should be in the area of around a half an inch across extreme northwestern Nebraska. And as you move towards southeastern Nebraska, if we're lucky, we'll see an inch and a half to two inches. I hope we will get that, but I think that's a little bit optimistic. Now, certainly as we get into Tuesday, we'll start to see the warm air returning into our region. And with that monsoonal flow coming around the top of this ridge, we could see some scattered thunderstorm activity developing once again across western Nebraska, lesser chance across eastern Nebraska. And then that will shift up into Dakotas on Wednesday with just extreme northern Nebraska in the line for isolated thunderstorm activity. As we get into Thursday, we'll start to see a trough working in, and that's going to start to bring the activity farther southward into Nebraska. So there's a chance for scattered thunderstorm activity shifting into southern Nebraska during the afternoon hours, and that will continue through Friday morning as it passes to the south and east of the state. So as we look at the terms of temperatures, we're looking at primarily temperatures in the 70s this week and across the east, moving up into the 80s next week. 90s look to be possible by midweek next week. 8 to 14 day forecast indicates cool temperatures to our north, and in terms of precipitation, the wet trend from the northern plains to the eastern United States. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews with Frayne Olson, Kirsten Wise, Matt Spangler, and Bob Wright, as well as Curtis Harms' report on UNL's Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic, are available individually online as part of the July 26th episode of Market Journal. Next week, Roy Smith will join us to look at corn and soybean markets. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Animal agriculture is vital to Nebraska. Livestock production not only contributes to our food supply, but also helps our rural communities. Livestock provides revenue for schools, creates jobs, supports Main Street, and enhances the future for farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Board's Animal Agriculture Initiative works to encourage growth of responsible livestock enterprises to benefit agriculture and Nebraska.